Good afternoon. Welcome back. Today we're going to talk about antivirals. There's a great quote here by Leo Tolstoy. Though the doctors treated him, let his blood, and gave him medications to drink, he nevertheless recovered. Remember, vaccines prevent disease. True or false, vaccines prevent infection. False. <laughs> yeah, vaccines prevent disease, but um, they really have little effect if you're already infected, with one exception that I've told you, and what's that? Rabies, you can be vaccinated after you're bitten because it takes so long for the virus to get into your central nervous system. So we have antivirals to prevent disease, severe disease after you are already infected. It can stop an infection uh, once it has started. We don't have a lot of <clears throat> antiviral compounds. We've been working on them for about 60 years and we have a hundred or so. Most of them are against HIV, hepatitis C virus, and herpes viruses. Only two for SARS-CoV-2. So why do we have so many for HIV, HCV, and herpes viruses? You will learn this today, but I wanna see if any of you have some insight. What are, what are those infections like? Are they? Are they acute infections? No, no, they're lifelong. they're lifelong infections. So you have plenty of time to get your drug and take it. Whereas an acute infection, you don't have a lot of time. And if you miss the window, it's too late. So this is an interesting graph of the number of approved drugs on the y-axis with time starting in 1959 and the different viruses are the different lines. And you can see it's starting in the 80s, a lot of activity for HIV where we have over 41 drugs because lifelong infections, so many people are infected and we have no vaccines. And we have Hep C, which recently has had a renaissance, we'll talk about today, influenza, hepatitis B, and herpes simplex viruses, but not a lot compared with antibiotics, for example, many fewer. And what about the target of these antivirals? These are three pie charts that look at that. So on the left, we have uh, the virus. So again, HIV is the, is the bulk of all the antivirals, 43 different antivirals against HIV. And then the next one is hep C, and then uh, the herpes viruses and hepatitis B virus. Now you can see the viruses which are causing lifelong infections, you're getting most of the antivirals. And then in the middle, the target of the antiviral. We have RNA or DNA polymerases, which is the majority. And then we have proteases, uh, which are the top two. And those are enzymes, right? So they're present in low amounts, catalytic amounts, so it's easy to inhibit them with an antiviral. Then we have other proteins of other viruses here as well. And then on the right is whether the target is a virus or a host protein. And most of the antivirals target host proteins, but you can see some do target the host and those are becoming increasingly more frequent because it's harder to get resistance if the target is a host protein. It's not impossible, but it's harder. So why are there so few antiviral drugs? Well, first of all, every compound has some effect on the cell. There's nothing that does not affect the cell. And so that can cause side effects. So often you find great inhibitors, but their side effects are unacceptable. So we don't develop those. I mean, no biological is without side effects. Remember that. No biological has zero side effects. You always have to do a risk benefit analysis which compares the risk from the drug to the risk from natural infection. And pretty much for all the drugs we have, all the vaccines we have, it always tilts in favor of getting the vaccine or the antiviral as opposed to being naturally infected. People will tell you otherwise. People will tell you that COVID is mild and you should get it. Don't believe them, especially after this course. Send them to me, <laughs> right? Don't you dare believe them, but they will be very persuasive. And in the end, they will call you a liar if you don't agree with them. That's their tactic, right? I know, because 
they either call you a liar or a pharma shill, which means you're getting money from pharma. And I don't get money. I would like to, but I don't. Also, so side effects are common. And also, remember, viruses are completely intertwined with the host cell. And so sometimes you get host effects as well, and that causes problems. But another reason is that we, for many viruses, we can't grow them in cells and culture. And we don't have an animal model. And they're dangerous to work with. So Ebola viruses and Lassa viruses, we can grow in the laboratory. There are animal models. You have to work in those under the highest containment, BSL-4, which we'll talk about um, in a couple of lectures. Hepatitis B virus and, hep and human papillomaviruses are hard to grow in the laboratory. It's hard to grow. Therefore, you, even if you take a protein and find an inhibitor, you eventually have to test its effect on virus reproduction, right? And sometimes it's not possible to do that. Uh, so those are the two reasons we have so few antivirals. But another one is the most important, and that is whatever compound you make has to block viral replication completely. You can't have modest effects. That will give you drug resistance. And this is compared to many other drugs that are out there. They don't have to be 100% effective at inhibiting their target. But antivirals have to be. And that's illustrated in the graph here where we have the viral load on the y-axis and the time on the x-axis. So the drug is given here uh, in the infection. And then we're, we have a high dose of antiviral, which completely inhibits replication. And then an intermediate dose allows some and a low dose allows even more. So this is an experiment using different doses, but it would be the same idea if you had uh, different potency antiviral. If you had an antiviral that only intermediate inhibits at an intermediate level, it would not be acceptable. Because if you allow virus replication in the presence of a drug, then you select for mutants. And this all makes drug discovery expensive, right? You have to find, you have to go through a lot of compounds and find the ones that are very, that are potent. So it all ends up costing a lot. Now, the other issue that I hinted on with, with the second slide is that many acute infections are short. Even though that's not part of the definition, the, the definition is a defined period of infection. In fact, many of them are short. So that's illustrated on this slide where you have a defined period of virus production, and a defined period of disease. And often, by the time you feel ill, it's too late to take an antiviral. The titers are already dropping in you. And therefore, what do we do? Well, we have to, one approach would be to give it as early an infection as you can. So if you have a test for a virus, uh, you can do that with influenza and with SARS-CoV-2. We have rapid diagnostic tests, which you can easily take and know early on if, at symptom onset what the virus is, and then you have to immediately start taking antivirals for influenza within a day or two and for SARS-CoV-2 five days or so and, and sometimes more. But if you wait, there's no more virus reproduction and it's too late. <clears throat> or you could give drugs to people prophylactically, right? We don't really like to do that because as I said, every drug has a side effect and the more people you give a drug to, the more side effects you are going to have. And uh, so in general, we don't like to give drugs to healthy people with one exception, that's PrEP, pre-exposure prophylaxis for HIV infection. People who are at risk for being infected can take PrEP to prevent being infected. And also we don't have broad spectrum antivirals, right? If you had a, a viral disease beginning, we could give you a broad spectrum, often as we do for, virus, for bacteria. You have bacterial infection. We give you a broad spectrum until we identify the bacterium and then we hone it in. We could do that with viruses, but we don't have broad spectrum antivirals to do that. And finally, the lack of diagnostic tests is a problem. We only, companies only make diagnostic tests for uh, viral diseases that are economically beneficial for them. So for rare infections, we don't have any tests and therefore 
no one's going to develop an antiviral. It's a chicken egg thing. The company won't make an antiviral because there's no diagnostic test and nobody wants to make a diagnostic test because there's no antiviral. So we're kind of stuck except in the biggest infections, of course. So let's talk a little bit about the history of antivirals and then we'll go through and see how some of them work. And this began, as you may remember from the, the slide, in the 1950s. So remember, by the 1950s, we know all about antibiotics and how beautifully they work. So chemists start to look at sulfonamide antibiotics to inhibit viruses. They make thiosemicarbazones, a class of compounds, to inhibit pox viruses because smallpox, even after World War II, was still a big issue globally. And then in the 60s and 70s, companies begin what we call blind screening programs, which were, which were inspired actually by the success in finding antibiotics. You can look in various places and find easily antibiotics. So chemists started doing this with viruses. So what is a blind screening? Well, you don't even focus on a virus or you don't even focus on a mechanism like RNA synthesis. You just take random chemicals and natural products, and you ask if they inhibit anything. Any, you can have a collection of viruses in your company, you try them all, uh, and you try them in cell culture. And what is, what is a, a random chemical? So there on the top left is a photograph of a chemical library of a company. Companies synthesize chemicals all the time for various purposes, and they store a bit of them, and you can access them and see if the 10,000 compounds that we have any of them can inhibit a virus in cell culture. And then if you, you, know, you can do the same thing with dirt, right? You can go to different places and take dirt samples and see if there's something in the soil produced by a microbe, of course, that would inhibit uh, virus reproduction in cell culture. And then if you get a hit, like you get dirt, something, some extract in dirt gives you inhibition, then of course you have to purify the compound and test it in cell culture further. You can also test it in animals. And if you have a chemical, you can do the same thing. You can try modifying it and so forth. Um, reducing toxicity, making it more soluble, making it more bioavailable, which means it goes to the place where you need it. If you wanna take a, an antiviral orally for a respiratory infection, you have to make sure it gets into the mucosal tissues uh, effectively, right? And other, properties as well. So this is blind screening, just taking stuff, chemicals and things that are in the soil and seeing if they inhibit your virus. You don't even ask initially what is being inhibited. You just want to know what is, if it inhibits and then proceed from there. And from these studies, people made thousands and thousands of molecules and screened and they had very little success. One exception is this compound here called amantadine which was approved in the 60s for treating influenza A virus infections. It's now one of four drugs that we have for influenza viruses. Unfortunately, we don't use it much anymore because most influenza viruses circulating are resistant to it. The, um, the farmers got wind of it. Farmer, farm animals, chip pick, pigs and chickens get influenza. And so farmers learned that they could put this in their feed and keep them healthy. And of course that leads to resistance because many, many hundreds of thousands of animals are being treated. And the more you treat, the more you're going to get resistance. And for any of these compounds that were discovered, we rarely knew the mechanism of action. In fact, amantadine, its mechanism wasn't discovered until the 90s, yet it was approved in the 60s to treat influenza. So most of these compounds, we didn't know how they worked. So today it's totally different. Today, we have recombinant DNA where we can take a gene from a virus and produce the protein, and we have amazing chemistry that lets us make different kinds of molecules. So we clone the genes, we express them in various organisms, cells and culture, yeast, insect cells, and we purify the, the protein. We can do atomic structures of the protein. Uh, we know, of course, the reproduction cycles of most viruses, so we can say we want to try inhibiting here at this point in the cycle. And even if you can't propagate a virus, you can make inhibitors. And then even, you know, that's a problem not being able to test it in cell culture, but maybe you could do it in animals. So nobody does blind screening anymore. We do very focused drug development. 
And here's a, here is a prototypic <coughs> uh, reproduction cycle of a virus. And at every step, there are antivirals available. So we have them for attach, we have attachment inhibitors, we have penetration and uncoding, the release of the genome, we have inhibitors of mRNA synthesis, we have inhibitors of processing of proteins, we have inhibitors of DNA and RNA replication, integration, assembly, and even release. So every step of the cycle. But you can see most of the inhib inhibitors are at steps that are catalytic, that are carried out by enzymes, right? So we have nucleic acid synthesis and proteases. So the, the uh, protease of SARS-CoV-2 is a target uh, for antivirals, and that would be Paxlovid, for example. But there are also inhibitors of RNA synthesis. So uh, just a few more words on how we discover drugs. It's a long pathway, it takes many years, you start with a medical need. You have to have a, a virus that's causing substantial uh, problems. And a, for, for a pandemic virus, that's obvious. Uh, but you're always caught catching up with a pandemic virus because it's, it can be novel. You do some research and you identify targets. You say, okay, this virus has an RNA polymerase. Uh, let's make sure it's, it's essential. And then you can go on and look for inhibitors of that. You can solve the structure of the, of the molecule and then try and design inhibitors based on that. Or you can use libraries, natural products, compound collections, et cetera, to do a variety of screens for inhibition. You get some hits. You do further chemistry to modify those compounds. You modify it in a variety of ways and then put it in animals before it gets into people. So the animal, all of this is preclinical testing and then in people is of course clinical testing. And some of the questions you ask and hopefully answer, will the compound get to the right place in the body at the right concentration? That's bioavailability. Will it persist long enough to be effective? Pharmacokinetics. You don't want it to have a half-life of 10 minutes, in which case you have to dose too often. And that Asking people to dose many times a day is a, is a prescription for failure. And then, is it safe? You do toxicity studies and specificity studies, uh, first in cells and culture and then in animals. You ask, is it safe? If a compound kills cells and culture, it will never get into animals, okay? And it could be safe in animals and then have some side effects in people. So you just don't know what's gonna happen. And it takes many years and it's quite expensive. And so here's a timeline for a typical drug discovery. You have discovery synthesis, preclinical studies in, in animals, and then safety surveillance, which begins before your phase one, during your phase one trial, of course, and then extends through all the phases and beyond licensure. Phase one, which is a safety study in a small number of healthy adults, just to make sure it's safe at the doses that you wanna use it at, which you figure out from the animal work. And then a phase two is efficacy, a few more subjects that time. And then a phase three, efficacy, side effects, and superiority to what's already out there. So if you already have a drug to treat a virus infection, you have to show that yours is better. You can't make an equivalent, it won't be licensed. <clears throat> and then after the phase trials, which you can see take 10 years, you have an FDA review, and then it's licensed. And then once it's in people, you have uh, continuing monitoring, which can be called a phase four. But in, of course, in, uh, in the, during the COVID pandemic, we accelerated all of this and we had had some compounds already in the pipeline. And so it just took a year or so to get those out, which is really an unprecedented um, development. The same thing happened for vaccines. So let's talk about some of the screens you can do to identify compounds. These can be very clever. And the idea would be you devise a screen that you can do in high volume or what we call high throughput screens, which can be done by robots actually and not need a person sitting there all day pipetting. So here is a screen where it's called a mechanism based screen because we're looking for inhibitors of a protease. So you synthesize a small peptide, A, B, C, D, uh, which is going to have the cleavage site for the protease. And then this peptide is coupled to a bead, which will help you remove it 
by centrifugation. And then it has um, a, a reporter on the other end, which something that you can assay. And so here, in this case, it's fluorescence, which can be measured by a machine. And then you add, so if you add the protease to the peptide without the drug, here's time versus the fluorescence of the soluble peptide, right? So you, you do the reaction, you separate, you spin it out, so you separate the beads from what's been cleaved and you measure the supernatant. You can see without the drug, you have increasing fluorescence intensity. The, the enzyme is cleaving the um, peptide and releasing the fluorescence label. And if you add the drug, you can inhibit the activity. And so this on the bottom here is what you get after cleavage. You get a soluble portion with the fluorescence label and, and the insoluble portion, which can be removed by centrifugation. So that is a mechanism-based assay because you're going after a protease. We also have cell-based screens. So that one was a in vitro screen, which you do in a test tube or a well of a plate. And here's a cell-based screen where we're using bacteria. And in this case, we have, we're using tetracycline resistance. So normally tetracycline inhibits bacterial growth, uh, but resistance can be achieved by this, uh, this pump. It's a tetracycline resistance uh, protein, which is embedded in the bacterial membrane. And when you add tet, tet to bacteria, this pumps it out. As fast as it comes in, it pumps it out. So the bacteria grow in the presence of that resistance protein. It's a multi-pass membrane protein. So then what you do is you can engineer a protease site into one of these loops. And if it's cleaved, it's gonna inactivate the resistance protein. So that happens to be an HIV protease site, which we know, we put it in there. And then in the presence of the HIV protease, if you produce the HIV protease in the bacteria, you inactivate the tetracycline efflux protein. And so now if you add tetracycline, uh, you get colonies. <clears throat> Sorry, if you, if you so if, if that protease cleaves the peptide, you get no colonies because there's no resistance possible. But if you have a protease inhibitor, so this yellow thing is the protease, the red is a protease inhibitor. Now the the efflux pump will not be cleaved, and you get colonies. So the assay is counting number of bacterial colonies. So if you're inhibitor is working, you don't get colonies and so forth. So that's a cell-based screen. And so what the, the raw materials for these screens, we've mentioned we have chemical libraries that companies have, natural products from the soil, combinatorial chemistry. So you can make small linkers, small chemical linkers and combine them in different ways. As you can see by this matrix here, you have linkers and fragments and you combine them in thousands and thousands of ways, it's called combinatorial chemistry, and you just test them all to see if some of them can attach to the uh, protein of interest that you want to inhibit. We also have structure-based design where you solve the structure of, a, say, an RNA polymerase. You see the active site and you try and model compounds that fit into it. And Computers can be used to design compounds that fit in, and then you synthesize them uh, and check them. And you can even do in silico screening, which you have the computer program model whether a specific compound would inhibit the protein or not. And all of this is high throughput. You can do 10,000 or more compounds a day, which is what you want to do. You want to screen as many as possible uh, for subsequent follow-up. And all of this can be done by robots. We use multi-well plates or microtiter plates, which are shown here. And they have either 96, 384, or 1,536 wells. I mean, the 96 well a human can do with a multi-channel pipetter, but these are very difficult to do. So robots can do that. The robots, here's a robot here, a big arm, basically, that can add reagents to each of these cell, uh, wells very quickly. The arm can pick it up and put it into an incubator. It can take it out of the incubator at the right time and read the results and send them to you anywhere around the world. So this is the way we do it now. We have these high throughput screening methods. First question, we have many antibiotics, but fewer antivirals. What is a reason for the difference? Robotic screening is slow. There are few serious viral infections. Resistance is a problem. Antivirals must be potent, all of the above. So let's see how we did 
<laughs> we had some trouble with this one. <clears throat> so the, the main, all of the above. Is robotic screening slow, really? I mean, robots are fast, aren't they? So you can screen 10,000 compounds a day. How many think you think a human could? So robotic screening isn't slow, but you know, some of you picked all of the above. That's why I'm saying there are a few serious viral infections. Is that true? No, of course not. Resistance is a problem, but it's not why we have so few antivirals, right? You get an antiviral and then you get resistant. The main reason is they must be potent. Now, if I had here, some viruses are hard to, to propagate and there are no animal models, that would be others, but um, it's just resistance in this case. Okay. Hopefully you get that. So speaking of resistance, you, whenever you make an antiviral, you should anticipate that you will get resistance. It's actually amazing that there's no resistance to Paxlovid. Paxlovid is a compound, it's two different drugs together. A SARS-CoV-2 protease inhibitor. And it's also a drug that was initially discovered for HIV, which we'll talk about today, which turns out to make the levels of the inhibitor higher. Anyway, no resistance so far to that, which is really interesting. So any, anyway, you should anticipate that you're gonna get resistance eventually because viruses make a lot of progeny, right? And they have high mu mutation frequencies. So this is a particular concern for chronic infections like hep C and hep B and HIV, where you treat people for long periods of time, you often get resistance. And all of those 100 drugs that we have, we have resistance to any of them already in our, uh, that we have detected. And this is, a, this is not good, right? Because we don't have a lot of antivirals. And so if you get resistance to whatever you're treating someone with, that's, that's it, you can't treat them any longer. For bacteria, we have many candidates, although they're becoming smaller and smaller as we have more and more resistance, far more than viruses though. So this is a problem having resistance. You can't treat the patient with the same drug. And if no other drug is available, you, you can't stop the infection. But we do study resistance to see what the mechanism of resistance is. And we sometimes use that to design new inhibitors that can get around that problem. So. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about mechanisms of drug resistance. RNA viruses, of course, all, all polymerases make mistakes, but for RNA polymerases, there's no error correction mechanism with the little asterisk, is, there's one exception, which I'll tell you in a moment. But these enzymes make one mistake in 10,000 to 100,000 in nucleotides polymerized, which is a million times higher than our host DNA polymerase error rate. And so in a viral, RNA of 10,000 bases, that frequency would give you a mutation in, in between one and 10 genomes. So one in 10,000 bases, every time a 10 KB genome replicates, you get one uh, mutation in it. So the exception is the nidoviral genomes, which have a proofreading exonuclease. So what is a nidovirus? They're very neat, as you can tell by the name. Now actually, nido is Latin for nest, <clears throat> and that's because the mRNAs of these viruses are nested. They overlap each other. So nidovirales is the order, and um, within it are families, and there's coronaviridae. Uh, and so these all have a proofreading exonuclease. Their genomes are very big, <clears throat> 30,000 bases and up, and so we think to maintain that genome length, you need to have error correction. And so, the name of the exonuclease is, uh, is NSP14 or XON, so NSP14, there it is right there. And this is the RNA polymerase complex. There's the RNA dependent RNA polymerase in red, which is moving down the RNA. There's a primer there and it's copying it. And the exo will detect mismatched bases that are misincorporated and take it out and the polymerase will fix it. So there is error correction. So the mutation rate of these nidovirales is about 10 times lower than other RNA viruses, but still pretty high. And as you see, we got lots of, we get lots of SARS-CoV-2 variants emerging because of that. Now in DNA viruses, uh, most DNA polymerases can detect a misincorporated nucleotide, excise it and replace it. And here's an example of that. There's a DNA being polymerized by DNA polymerase. 
And here's a mismatch in the second line. Wrong base is put in, it happens at random. And these, there's an enzyme called a three prime, five prime exonuclease, which will chew this back. And then the polymerase will replace it with the right base. So these viruses with DNA genomes evolve much more slowly because they have less diversity. They have a very lower mutation rate, which we'll come back to when we talk about evolution, which is next time. So let's talk about some specific antivirals and how they work, just to give you an idea for mechanisms. And we're gonna go through each of these steps for which we have some uh, inhibitors and talk about how they work. So first we have an entry inhibitor. So the very first step there is entry. And um, this is uh, amantadine, the drug first discovered in the 60s for an antiviral for influenza and the mechanism discovered in the 90s, it interacts with the viral M2 protein. And the M2 protein is this channel in the virus particle. So here's an influenza virus particle, right, with the hemagglutinin and neuraminidase embedded in the membrane. And here is a minor protein called the M2, which is actually a channel. It's a very small channel, and it lets protons pass through it. So protons are very small, so this is a very small channel. What this does, it blocks the entry of protons into the virus particle and prevents uncoating. So remember, during entry of influenza virus, the virus binds its receptor, it's taken up into the endosome, and the endosome moves towards the nucleus. Remember, the pH drops as the endosome moves into the cell. How does the pH drop? Well, protons are pumped into the endosome by a proton pump right there. And those protons pass through the M2 ion channel into the interior of the virus particle. So the protons lower the pH and they cause fusion of the viral and endosome membranes mediated by HA. We talked about that before, but protons also get into the interior of the virus and that is needed so that the RNAs can get out. Because if the pH of the interior is neutral, the RNAs stay stuck inside, they never get out, they never go in the nucleus, so infection is stopped. So amantadine binds in the channel, it prevents protons from going into the interior of the virus particle and blocks infection by that mechanism, okay? Now, we get, this is a model of the ion, cha uh, the ion channel. It's four polypeptides, four copies of M2, those are in blue, that form this channel. There's the virus membrane where it's embedded, and the protons go from the exterior of the particle, this is inside the endosome, through the channel into the virus. Now, amantadine binds the channel in two ways. It, it can bind on the outside of the channel and presumably induces conformational changes that don't allow uh, the protons to get in, or they can also bind inside the channel and directly block it. Those are the red molecules, that's the amantadine. We, we get resistance very easily to this by amino acids that simply prevent amantadine blocking or uh, binding or don't allow the conformational changes to occur. So that's, right now we have resistance everywhere to uh, amantadines. Another entry inhibitor is called Maraviroc, which is an HIV antiviral. And this is an inhibitor of CCR5. So here's the compound, Maraviroc here, pretty complicated organic compound, and this is CCR5. So what is CCR5? I don't know if you remember, but when HIV binds to cells, it interacts with two receptors, CD4 initially and CCR5. Both are required for entry. If Maraviroc is bound to CCR5, and that's the target, so there's Maraviroc in blue bound to CCR5, it uh, can no longer interact with the glycoprotein of HIV, so it blocks entry. So it's an entry inhibitor. It's really the only one that we have. It's quite unique. Yeah, we have resistance to that as well. Okay, moving on to the polymerases. We have modified the four bases in many ways to inhibit polymerases. And the first one we'll talk about is acyclovir. This is the anti-herpes simplex virus drug which you can now buy over the counter. Very effective drug. It's two things here you have to remember. It's a prodrug, 
So what you take is not the final drug that inhibits the virus, it has to be modified. And secondly, it's a nucleoside analog. And here you have to remember that a nucleoside is a base without any phosphates, all right? So a nucleoside analog is mimicking a base without phosphate. There are also nucleotide analogs, which mimic a base with between one and three phosphates, all right? So bases can have one, two, or three phosphates, and there are some drugs that mimic the phosphorylated version. Those are called nucleotide analogs. But um, acyclovir is a nucleoside analog, and it is a modified version of guanosine. So here in the middle in yellow are the four bases, A, G, T, and C. We have modified each of them in a variety of ways, as you can see here, to make different inhibitors of polymerases. And so here is a cyclovir, which you can see is guanosine with the ribose trashed, basically. We've taken off a couple of carbons, as well as this hydroxyl, and now we have this molecule. Uh, and it was further modified to become gancyclovir, which is a, a bit more active than acyclovir as well. So in, inhibitor of herpes simplex virus, very good drug. The way this works, so it's a nucleoside analog, right? It's an analog of the base without any phosphates on it. And it, has a, it is a prodrug, it has to be activated. And so what happens is here's the acyclovir, it gets, it gets into a cell. And if the cell is infected with herpes simplex virus, that cell is making a viral protein called thymidine kinase. That enzyme will phosphorylate acyclovir, puts one phosphate onto it. And now you have acyclovir monophosphate. And then the cell kinases do the second two phosphorylations, the second and the third. And then finally, the acyclovir triphosphate is incorporated into DNA by the polymerase. But because it's lacking a hydroxyl here, you can't add the next base. So here's guanosine, which has the hydroxyl. And if you put a guanosine in, then you can add the next base onto that hydroxyl, right? Acyclovir doesn't have it, so it's a chain terminator. As soon as that gets into the DNA, you can't complete the DNA, so that inhibits DNA synthesis. So it's a prodrug, it has to be modified, and it only get modified in virus-infected cells. It's beautiful gonna have less toxicity because of that because in uninfected cells, the drug will get in, but it's not gonna do anything because that first phosphate has to be added by TK. It's just really a great design. <clears throat> it was improved by adding a couple of, uh, an amino acid, valine, to the drug. <clears throat> Here's acyclovir, and chemists found that if you added valine here, producing valacyclovir, it is has markedly improved bioavailability. So if you need to take it orally, <clears throat> this modification makes it more bioavailable. And what happens is when you take this drug valcyclovir, the, the valine is actually cleaved off and you get a cyclovir uh, in the cell. So it's a nice example of how you can modify a drug to improve its uh, bioavailability. <clears throat> Unfortunately, we do get a acyclovir resistant herpes Simplex viruses that rise spontaneously. Some, there are two classes of mutants. Some of the mutants cannot phosphorylate the prodrug, so the mutations are in the viral TK gene. So mutations in the gene encoding TK so that the TK can no longer phosphorylate acyclovir and therefore no, there's not gonna be any inhibition, right? And then another class of mutants cannot incorporate the phosphorylated uh, acyclovir into DNA. So the, these are in the DNA polymerase. They, they are presented with uh, acyclovir triphosphate and they can't do anything with it. And so they're resistant to inhibition by that. Okay, so let's go to another uh, nucleoside analog, AZT, the first anti-HAV drug. And you can look at this, this is AZT, there are no phosphates, right? So it's a nucleoside analog. So this drug had been known before the AIDS pandemic began in 1980s. It was discovered in screening for anti-tumor compounds. And it was screened. So all the existing drugs that were known were screened for anti-HIV activity. And this, is one of the, this was the first that was discovered and licensed. It is phosphorylated by cellular kinases, very different from, AZT, from acyclovir. 
So it's going to get into uninfected cells and be phosphorylated and inhibit polymerases there as well. So it has a lot more side effects. It's a chain terminator. You get, it gets in the cell, you have one, two, and three phosphates put on, and then it gets incorporated by reverse transcriptase into the DNA and it, it terminates the chain because there's no oxygen here, right? There's no hydroxyl, there's a nitrogen there as well. Um, it has somewhat preferred inhibition of HIV RT over cells. So it works as an antiviral, but a lot of side effects. And this in fact made a lot of people stop taking it because they felt miserable. And if you, um, if you saw the movie Dallas Buyers Club, you learn all about those side effects. And the fact that early on in the pandemic, there wasn't very much of the drug, so patients were splitting the pills and sharing them. And that told us that the dose we were using was too high because the split pills worked as well. So the NIH reduced, uh, NCI reduced the drug. So this has a lot of side effects. It's given orally, but the half-life is an hour. It's horrible. So you have to dose patients two to three times a day. And this immediately led to the selection of mutants. So one hour half life is really bad, but it's all we had at the time. And in fact, AIDS activists were clamoring for the FDA to approve this because they had nothing else. And it was good that they did. It did save many lives, but not the perfect drug by any means. We don't really use this any longer. Resistance arose very quickly. Um, single amino acid changes at one of four sites in the reverse transcriptase. Here's the RT uh, crystal structure, and there's the polymerase uh, active site. So we have changes that uh, do not bind phosphorylated AZT. So a very simple resistant mechanism. The enzyme has changed, and now it doesn't bind the phosphorylated AZT. So people started to develop new nucleoside analogs, DDI, DDC, D4T, 3TC. And people got the idea of using two drugs together because the resistance to one was huge. We got resistance to each of these by themselves. But if you put two together, well, you delayed the emergence of resistance, but you still got resistance to two drugs in less than a year. We'll talk more about that. And then another class of inhibitors of uh, HIV RT was developed. These are the non-nucleoside HIV RT inhibitors, NNRTI. So what I've shown you so far, these are nucleosides, they're analogs, they get incorporated into the DNA. These drugs bind the polymerase away from the active site and induce a change in the enzyme so it doesn't work anymore. And they include nevarapine, delavidardine, and efavirenz, which bind uh, at different sites. So here's the polymerase active site. So here's the nevarapine binding site. So it is not a chain terminator. It is not a nucleoside analog. It it's a small molecule that binds the enzyme and inactivates it. We got resistance to these as well, very rapidly. Amino acid substitutions uh, in any of the amino acids that line the nevarapine binding site. We no longer use these alone for treatment of AIDS, but they're very useful in combination uh, therapy. So it was really a learning experience that we developed all these amazing inhibitors and one by one they, they failed. Before we go on to other mechanisms, let's talk about SARS-CoV-2 nucleoside analogs. Remdesivir is a prodrug of a adenosine nucleoside analog. So it's a chain terminator. So there's adenosine down there. Here is remdesivir and it is a prodrug. So it's got some extra uh, molecules attached on the left here that get removed when it gets into cells, but because of this uh, N group here, you see that's very different from uh, the adenosine. It is a very good inhibitor. This drug was actually developed for the West African Ebola outbreak, which was 2013. And um, it, it inhibits many RNA viruses by chain termination. And at the onset of the COVID pandemic, people said, let's test it. Let's test all the compounds we have found to inhibit replication of SARS-CoV-2 in cells. That was given a phase three trial in people, and it was given a emergency use authorization. So it's not licensed, but you're allowed to use it. And then they would accumulate data and decide whether to license or not. So this was the first 
bona fide COVID antiviral. It was give, it has to be given intravenously, which is a problem, right? Uh, and if you give it to hospitalized patients, it has no effect. Because by the time you get in the hospital, you're past the virus replication phase. When you're in the hospital, you have severe lung defect because of inflammation and you have hypoxia and uh, an antiviral doesn't help you. In fact, the earliest trials of remdesivir were done on hospitalized patients and it showed no benefit. And people were ready to give up when somewhere a virologist came forward and said, it's too late, you have to treat earlier. So now if you give this within seven days of symptom onset, you get an 87% reduction to progression. What is progression? Hospitalization. 87% reduction in going into the hospital if you take remdesivir. Of course, it has to be IV. So now we developed infusion centers where people could do that rather than having to go to the hospital, but it is still an effective drug. Then we have uh, molnupiravir, which is another nucleoside analog. This was developed in 2015 as a cytidine nucleoside analog. So here's cytidine. Here on the right is molnupiravir. So you can see it's cytidine with some uh, extra chemicals here on the left. And that's a prodrug. It is modified in the cell to this form, which is the active form, uh, which is, is uh, different enough from cytidine to be a chain terminator. You see there are very minor differences. There's a hydroxyl up here. It's enough to make it a chain terminator. So this, actually, sorry, it's not a chain terminator, is a mutagen. It templates as a U. So this is a C analog that templates as a U, so it causes mutation. So when you incorporate it in place of a C, the polymerase looks at it as a U and puts an A instead of a G in. And that causes lots of mutations and inactivates infectivity by mutagenesis. So it inhibits SARS-CoV-2 in cells in mice, inhibited uh, transmission in ferrets, so it was given a U EUA in the US. It's orally bioavailable, so it's a pill that you can take and now it's recommended for people over 18 years who are at high risk for progression, people who can't take Paxlovid. And unfortunately, the impact on progression is only 30%, but it's better than nothing. Resistance to which antiviral would involve amino acid changes in a viral enzyme? A cyclovir, a mantidine, penicillin, or all of the above? Hey, how do we do? Answer is acyclovir. Amino acid changes in an enzyme. So acyclovir, the enzyme is thymidine kinase or the DNA polymerase, right? Amantadine is not an enzyme, it's a channel, right? All of the above. Penicillin, it's an antibacterial, right? Don't prescribe that for viruses, please. People did that for COVID all the time. Doesn't work. And I'm not even a doctor, I know that. <laughs> Integrase inhibitors, so the nucleic acid of HIV, the DNA made by RT goes into the nucleus and integrates into the cell. The enzyme that does it is integrase. So we have a couple of chemical inhibitors that basically insert themselves into the active site of the integrase. So the integrase reaction is shown at the bottom. So integrase is the tan molecule. We have retroviral DNA and host cell DNA in purple, and the integrase makes nicks and ligates the DNAs together. The, uh, these drugs insert into the active site of the integrase, and they deform the donor and acceptor molecules that are being ligated together. So in the absence of drug, here is the active site of the enzyme. So here is the... Um, the, the three prime hydroxyl of the viral DNA, the last three bases there. Uh, and then when you put raltegravir in, look at this A gets pushed all the way down. Here's the drug in purple right there. It pushes the drug down. So now this, and it bends the three prime hydroxyl so it no longer can integrate. And then the other drug, DTG, does a similar thing. There it is in cyan. And there it's pushing the three prime end as well. So these inhibit the integration reaction of the integrase. All right, so we have also a polymerase inhibitor <clears throat> for hepatitis C virus. 
This is called sofosbuvir. It's a prodrug. So it is a modified uh, nucleoside. And it is shown here in, in, um, in this yellow box. You see there's the base uh, right there with some modifications of the fluorine there in particular. And then this is extra stuff that's, that's removed later. So it's cellular enzymes remove all this, these extra uh, atoms and now it's a, a nucleoside monophosphate. So this is a very interesting inhibitor because it has one phosphate. It's a nucleotide inhibitor. So there it, you see it has a phosphate. Normally phos phosphorylated compounds don't get into cells well, but chemists figured out if you hide it here, then it can get through the cell membrane because phosphates are negatively charged. But putting these atoms around it gets it through the membrane and then those are removed by cell enzymes. And so now you have one phosphate and then the cell adds the second and the third. The reason this is cool is because addition of the first phosphate is the rate limiting step. It's very slow and you're already around it by having the phosphate on this chemical. And then the second two phosphate additions are very quick. So now you have this drug, which is a, tain, a chain terminator and really has revolutionized treatment of hep C. Unfortunately, it's very expensive. The 12 week treatment is $84,000. <clears throat> Baloxavir is a new influenza antiviral approved in 2018. Uh, it's an inhibitor of the influenza virus endonuclease. So remember, I was telling you about this enzyme that cleaves mRNAs of the host cell to make primers for synthesis of viral mRNA. And so people used that knowledge to identify an inhibitor of that endonuclease. This is actually better than the other two flu antivirals. If you take one dose, you can take it up to 48 hours after infection, and it is very effective at inhibiting, but very few physicians seem to know about it or uh, prescribe it. Then we have protease inhibitors. These again are enzymes that cleave proteins during virus infection. So this is an example of a retroviral infected cell. This is HIV. And the protease is incorporated into the virus particles. The protease uh, is PR, this light blue circle. It's incorporated into the particle. And then once the particles are released, the protease cleaves the viral polyprotein and the virions are infectious. So it's absolutely required for the production of infectious virions. So an inhibitor should be effective. And these are, this is one of the first antivirals that was developed to inhibit the HIV protease, ritonavir. It's a peptidomimetic, which means that the drug looks like the amino acids that form the cleavage site uh, of, the, of the substrate. So for example, here on the top left, that is the polymerase, the, the protease substrate. It's cleaving the polymerase. And here you have a phi and a pro and the, and the alpha helical chain there. And they made a model of the transition state of this cleavage. And they, the first drug looked like this. You can see it, it vaguely mimics the cleavage site. It wasn't so active and they, they modified eventually and come up with this very active drug, ritonavir, which binds to the protease. So this is a 3D model of the HIV protease. You can see the drug binds in there. That's the active site with the yellow coloring. Now ritonavir is the other component of Paxlovid. Paxlovid is an inhibitor of uh, SARS-CoV-2 protease and it's metabolized very quickly. But if you had this drug, this inhibits CYP3A, a mitochondrial enzyme, which is responsible for drug turnover. And so it gives you more lasting, longer lasting Paxlovid. So ritonavir is actually used in a variety of different drugs now because it can raise the serum level of, of many of them. There's also a protease inhibitor for hep C, the viral, genome is translated into a long polyprotein, which needs to be cleaved uh, by the, uh, the viral protease. And you can see here, NS3 is making all these cleavages. So this is the structure of NS3. And here is a inhibitor, telaprevir, which again is a peptidomimetic mimetic that fits into the active site of the enzyme. It's the red molecule there and inhibits cleavage of the polyprotein, which is absolutely essential, of course, for infectivity. And here is Paxlovid. This, uh, this compound was developed during uh, the pandemic. And the, um, 
the key here is that the viral RNA is translated early in infection into two long polyproteins that need to be processed to make the RNA polymerase. So there's a viral protease called M protease that processes this. And Paxlovid was developed to be an inhibitor of that protease. Here is Paxlovid right there. And that's the structure of the molecule in the active site uh, of the protease. And these are two uh, assays showing the, the inhibition of uh, infection. So this is actually enzyme activity on the top. And so the velocity of the enzyme is being inhibited the, the production of substrate is being inhibited by increasing concentrations of drug. And there is SARS-CoV-2 in black. It's best with SARS-CoV-2. But all these are other coronaviruses. Here's SARS-CoV-1, which is buried in there. So they're all nicely inhibited by SARS-CoV-2. This is nanometer amount. So, you know, 50% inhibition of SARS-CoV-2 is about 10 nanometers, which is great. And on the bottom here is inhibition of viral induced CPE cytopathic effect. Again, SARS-CoV-2 in black with increasing amounts, you have 100% uh, in inhibition of CPE. So this is combined with ritonavir and that, that is what uh, the drug actually is, two different drugs. We have neuraminidase inhibitors for influenza, which now inhibit the release of virus particles from cells. So let's, let's explain what's going on here. So influenza viruses are made by budding. The virus particles bud from the plasma membrane. And remember, the, the receptor for the HA of influenza virus is sialic acid, right, which is a common cell surface protein. And so as these viruses are released, they would simply rebind to the cell surface. Here is this red molecule here is sialic acid, let's say. So the viruses that are released would simply bind again to the cell surface. They would never go away from the cell. If it weren't for the neuraminidase, the neuraminidase is the second spike in the viral envelope, which cleaves sialic acid from the cell surface where the viruses are budding so that the particles can now go free away from the cell. And here on the left is a picture of cells infected with an influenza virus, which has a defective neuraminidase. You can see the viruses are all lined up, <coughs> excuse me, in a chain at the cell surface because their HAs are sticking to sialic acids. There's no neuraminidase activity to cleave it off. So that's the basis of two NA neuraminidase inhibitors of influenza. We have uh, zanamivir or relenza and oseltamivir or Tamiflu. These are designed to be mimics of sialic acid, right? That's the substrate of the neuraminidase. Here's neuraminidase with sialic acid in it. So the neuraminidase binds sialic acid and cleaves it from the rest of the sugars. And these inhibitors bind in the active site of the NA and prevent it from being active. So that was the design. These are basically computer-aided designs based on the structure of the neuraminidase. So they're designed to mimic the natural ligand sialic acid. And the idea was the closer the inhibitor is to the natural compound sialic acid, the less likely you're gonna get mutations, right? Because if it looks just like sialic acid and the neuraminidase sustains an amino acid change, so it won't bind, it's also not gonna bind sialic acid so the virus won't be infectious. That was the idea. So in principle, Zanamivir looks more like sialic acid than does oseltamivir. So here on the left, we have sialic acid. In red, we have the neuraminidase binding sialic acid. And zanamivir looks more like sialic acid than does oseltamivir. It's shown by these two different symbols here. And so oseltamivir resistance is much more frequent than zanamivir, we think, because it's not a good mimic of, of, of sialic acid. You can change the neuraminidase to block binding of Tamiflu and it will still, the enzyme will still bind sialic acid because the two are so different. All right, which of the following targets for HIV antivirals inhibits the earliest stage of infection? Nucleoside inhibitors, 
NNRTIs, non-nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitors, CCR5 inhibitors, integrase inhibitors, or fusion inhibitors. So we didn't talk about fusion inhibitors for HIV, but there are some. So the answer is the CCR5, right? That's attachment. That's the earliest step in infection. Uh, the nucleoside and NNRTIs are later. The integrase is even later, and the fusion are after attachment. Can we make broad spectrum antivirals? Were there some experimental ones? None of them are licensed. Here is favipiravir, which is a inhibitor of RNA viruses in general. It targets the RNA polymerase. It's a nucleoside analog. So here's favipiravir, gets phosphorylated, gets incorporated, and chain terminates. And all these viruses, plus strand RNA viruses, minus strand RNA viruses, have all been shown to be inhibited by this drug. It is licensed in Japan to treat influenza, but it's not licensed in the US. The activity against each virus is too low, in our opinion, to warrant uh, licensing. But it, it shows as a proof of principle that you can make a broad spectrum inhibitor. We also have broad spectrum inhibitors of DNA viruses. This one, Sidofavir, that's it on the upper right, uh, is a acyclic cytosine phosphate. So this inhibits many DNA viruses, as you can see, and it contains a phosphate group there. Same trick as we saw before hiding the, the phosphate from cellular enzymes. It gets into the cell with that phosphate. It is then diphosphorylated by host cell enzyme, and this has a good affinity for DNA polymerases uh, than the host. So in general, these acyclic nucleotide analogs, which means the ribose has been broken here, and we have a phosphate in them. Uh, it's a nucleotide analog. They, they have a higher affinity for viral polymerases than cell, which is good. You're going to have fewer side effects. But again, these are not licensed for use. It's just a proof of principle that we can do this. And maybe if you know someone has an RNA virus infection, you could treat them with a broad spectrum anti-RNA virus inhibitor. All right, so for the last moments today, I want to talk about two stories of antiviral success, combination therapy for AIDS and hepatitis C. And we have had a lot of drug development for these viruses because you have lifelong persistent infections, plenty of time to get a prescription and take it. There's no window. So for AIDS, we treat uh, with a triple therapy. It's called HART, highly active antiretroviral therapy. We treat HIV as a chronic disease. We do not cure it, but we prevent your symptoms. We prevent you from going into AIDS. And we have a pill with three inhibitors which target different mechanisms and it minimizes resistance, but it does not cure infection. You still have a latent reservoir. You have cells in you that have integrated proviruses of HIV that you can't get rid of. So if you stop taking the pill, the virus starts to replicate. So here's the mathematics of drug resistance. If you need one mutation in the target for drug resistance, and the mutation rate is one in every 10,000 bases polymerized, that means one base is substituted in every 10,000 viruses, each base of the whole genome, and 10,000 viruses, each base should be substituted. An infected person makes 10 to the 10th new viruses a day, so you simply divide 10 to the 10 by 10 to the 4th. You're gonna make a million viruses a day with resistance to one drug. So that's why we get drug failure with monotherapy. <clears throat> Two drugs developing resistance is now 10 to the 4th times 10 to the 4, 10 to the 8th, so we now make 100 viruses a day that are resistant to two drugs, so it lasts a little longer. But three drugs, you need 10 to the 12 viruses, and so that's why triple drug therapy works really well. Now, despite the success, there are triple drug resistant HIVs circulating out there. So any new patient you have with HIV AIDS, you have to genotype their virus to see if it has mutations that confer resistance to any antiviral, and you have to tailor the antiviral, the triple therapy based on the genotype. So if they have a resistance to one triple therapy, you have to try another one. So here are all the HIV antivirals as of a couple of years ago. So here we have, these are all the names on the left. These are the targets, the reverse transcriptase inhibitors, the non-nucleoside, the protease, integrase, the uh, Maraviroc-like 
entry inhibitors. And then below you have combinations of, of two or three different drugs, as you can see, with different names made by different companies and their release dates. And so we continue to make more triple therapy combinations to try and make sure we can treat uh, all patients. And antiretroviral therapy saves lives. This is the uh, projected numbers of people receiving antiretroviral therapy in the different WHO regions. And you can see the African region, which has the vast majority of HIV infections, is getting the most, which is the way it should be. Uh, and here on the bottom are deaths that are prevented. So we can, we've so far prevented 10 million adult deaths by the use of antiretroviral therapy. And we have also uh, reduced the number of infections due to uh, mother to child transmission of the virus, pregnant mother to child transmission. So these are new HIV infections in blue. You can see they're going down and the number of infections averted by the use of treating the, the pregnant mother has gone up. So these are very successful. And we also do pre-exposure prophylaxis. This is daily double therapy. So tenofovir and emtricitabine, for example, for people who are at high risk for infection. This reduces the risk of transmission by about 90%. Sexual transmission and transmission by intravenous drug use is reduced by about 70%. So if you have patients who are intravenous drug users, they should take this to prevent getting infected because they're not gonna stop using intravenous drugs. This is a way to stop them from getting uh, HIV. And for hepatitis C, we have made amazing uh, strides in developing antivirals. This is a graph showing you the length in weeks of treatment that we've needed for each different regimen. So before 2013, we used to use interferon plus ribavirin, and you had to treat patients for 80 weeks. It's almost two years, right? And most of, many of them did not respond. So we started to look for direct acting antiviral because uh, pegylated interferon only is, 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 a, is a, you know, it's inducing ISGs. So in 23, between 2013 and 2015, we developed uh, different inhibitors. So Bosepravir and telaprevir, which had to be used together with the standard of care, which was interferon and ribavirin. And then we did trials to show that these were better. And then we started to use combination therapies on their own. And over the years now, we have gotten to the point where you can treat a patient for about 20 weeks with double or triple therapy for hep C. So that's really amazing. In fact, the shortest treatment here is about eight weeks or so. So again, really neat strides made in the development of hep C uh, antivirals. However, you have to be very wary because as I said on day one, there are 10 to the 16th HIV genomes today circulating, which means there's resistance to every antiviral we have in any combination and any that we'll ever make. So antivirals will make you live, but they won't cure you and for that, we need to prevent the disease from occurring, and that's so far been elusive. <clears throat> Next time, we're gonna talk about evolution, how viruses change, and what are the selection pressures that act upon them.